Okay, Romans chapter 8, concerning the manifestation of the sons of God. Now, the word manifestation means to make known, make known in a public way. And so we're going to be talking about that. But we pick up here in verse 17. He's talking about the true children of God. Those who are, uh, whom God chose before the foundation of the world. Those whom God has justified in his sight, forgiven their sins, declared them righteous in his sight by the merits of Christ's obedience unto death as our surety, our substitute, our redeemer. That's who he's talking about. Those who, uh, for whom Christ died on the cross, the redeemed of the Lord. That's the true children of God. And they are made known first, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more in a, in a minute. They're made known first by the calling of the Spirit, wherein the Holy Spirit is sent from Christ to impart life and knowledge within them through the preaching of the gospel. That's the new birth. It's regeneration and conversion. When God brings a sinner and gives him eyes to see, gives her eyes to see and ears to hear, a new heart, the scripture. There's a lot of, lot of different ways it's described in the scripture. But it's basically bringing a sinner from the darkness and deception of unbelief and ignorance uh, to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as he is identified and distinguished in the word. The true Christ. We see what we didn't see before. Mark preached on that last week, you know, uh, uh, a sight for blind eyes. We were born blind. Just like that man in John chapter 9. We were born blind spiritually. But God gave us eyes to see under the preaching of the gospel. And what did we see? We saw the glory of God revealed in the face of Jesus Christ. We saw the light of his glory. The light of his finished work. The light of his righteousness. And God brought us to faith in Christ and repentance of dead works. And that's when we're manifested to ourselves, actually. And that's what Paul had been talking about. Verse 16, the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That's how the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit. You know, that word spirit, it's, it's like the word breath. It means life. There's life within. And the Holy Spirit bears witness with our life within, our spirit, by showing us the truth of the word of God and assuring us that we are the children of God. So that's what we're talking about. The assurance of full salvation and final glory uh, uh, by the sovereign, powerful grace of God based upon the merits of the righteousness of Christ that's been imputed to us. And if his righteousness has been imputed to us, at some point in time, God's going to bring us under the preaching of the gospel, and he's going to turn on that light. He's going to give us those eyes to see and ears to hear. And the, the apostle, in these verses, look at verse 17. He says, and if children. Now, I always make the distinction about the if statements of Scripture, that they're not conditional, but they're evidential. And so... That's what he's talking about. This is evidence that we're children of God. This is not conditions we meet in order to become children of God. Now, a lot of translators, some translators will say the word if could be translated since. And that's okay. But we, we're studying, we've got the King James Version of the Bible here, and it says if. So I make that distinction for that reason. But it could be. And since children, since we are children. And we looked at that last time, how how uh, God adopted us into his family in Christ before the foundation of the world. And it says, and if we're children, or since we're children, then heirs. We're heirs. We're, we are the recipients of an inheritance, heirs of God. And how did we get this inheritance? We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. He says we're joint heirs with Christ. That's how we got it. Christ is our elder brother in that sense. And you know, uh, he's, like, he's called sometimes the firstborn of every creature, uh, every creature, talking about, and that's talking about his resurrection in some passages. But what it's talking about, you know, the law of the firstborn under the old covenant, or even under the patriarch, uh, uh, patriarchal uh, time. The firstborn was, the, was to be the spiritual head of the family. Well, Christ is our spiritual head. 
And he, by virtue of, of his nature, has that inheritance given to him because he's the second person of the Trinity, God in human flesh. And then he earned it by his work on the cross. And the reason we have it is because we're joint heirs with Christ. It's because of our union with Christ. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. We only earned and deserved hell. But because we're in union with Christ, and that's, that's one of the things that Paul, this, this is the whole premise of it. You know, he says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. The only reason we have this inheritance is because uh, we're in Christ. Because of his blood to put away our sins, his righteousness to justify us. And so what, what he's showing here is that being heirs of God, we are, the, we are the recipients of an inheritance that's incorruptible, as Peter said. It's, it cannot be taken away, it cannot be corrupted. And he says, if so be that we suffer with him, or since we suffer with him, in verse 17. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. That we may be also glorified together. So we could say, now the if there again. It's not, it's not conditional. We don't earn this inheritance because of our suffering. Uh, I've heard years, years and years ago, I, I would hear preachers at funerals talk about somebody who got sick with some bad disease that they suffered with and then they died. And at the funeral... Uh, you hear stuff like that would indicate, say, well, I know he or she's in heaven because they suffered much here on earth. Well, suffering on earth will not get you into heaven. I don't care how much you suffer. Our suffering is the consequence of sin. But this suffering here is suffering with Christ, if so be, or since we suffer with him. Now, think about it this way. We suffered with him legally because when he died, we died. When he was buried, we were buried. All that Christ went through for us as our representative, we were with him uh, legally, uh, representatively, and we suffered with him. And, but that's, but, and, and that's the basis of our whole salvation. But what Paul has in mind here is the suffering that believers experience when, the, when we take sides with Christ in faith and in repentance, when we take sides with Christ against his enemies, against the unbelieving world, that's what he's talking about. In other words, being a child of God separates us from the world. And being a child of God causes us to testify that the world and its deeds are evil. That the best efforts of sinners to make themselves acceptable to God is wicked and evil because it fails to glorify God. It denies Christ. It lifts, it exalts the sinners. And when we do that, what happens? We suffer persecution. The, Paul called it the persecution of the cross. It comes over our testimony. Uh, uh, Christ talked about it in John, uh, he talked about it in the Sermon on the Mount. When he said, blessed are you when you suffer for righteousness sake. That's over our testimony of the gospel. We preach that there's only one righteousness that will save sinners and make sinners acceptable to God. And that's the imputed righteousness of Christ. And any righteousness that sinners think they have is filthy rags in the sight of God. And that brings persecution. That brings derision. Christ taught his disciples in John 15, 18, marvel not if the world hates you. It hates me before it hated you. So, and, and that's just the way it is because we testify of it that its deeds are evil. And that, what, that's what Paul's talking about. Over in the book of 2 Timothy, I've got this one, uh, side, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse uh, 10. The apostle Paul uh, Encouraging Timothy here, he says in verse 10 of 2 Timothy 3, he says, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, and patience, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me, 
Verse 12, yea, now listen to this, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now that's what he's talking about. Christ talked about this. He said, taking up your cross and following me. That's part of it. He told his disciples when he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God is here. He said, they'll, they'll, uh, eventually they will, they will uh, persecute you. They'll deliver you up before the council. Uh, in John 16, he said, they'll throw you out of the synagogue and those who will murder you will think they're doing God's service and they do it because they neither know me nor the Father, he said. And that's the suffering that he's talking about. Let me, uh, there's one verse, I don't know why I failed to put this in your lesson, but write, if you want to, write it down. It's in Philippians. And the point I want to make with this verse, Philippians chapter 1, this specific suffering that comes over our doctrine. That's what it comes over. You know, when I was growing up, I was taught that the suffering, that, he, that it was like this, that if you were invited to a party and they were all drinking and you decided you weren't going to drink, that they'd make fun of you. Now, that may be suffering to you, but that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about the suffering that comes with our, our public identification and our public proclamation that we side with the Lord Jesus Christ against the world, the religious world. And he says uh, in another place here in Philippians, this specific suffering is evidence of one who has been brought by God to true faith in Christ and repentance of dead works. That's what Paul's meaning in Romans 8, 17. He says, You're joint, we're children of God, we're heirs of God, we're joint heirs with Christ, if so be, or since we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. So that suffering is a specific evidence of being a true child of God, but it's also, it exposes the unbelief and pending condemnation of those who do not believe it, who hate the gospel, who persecute us, and that's what Philippians 1 Look at verse 27 of Philippians 1. He says, Only let your conversation, your walk, be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. In other words, walk appropriately to the gospel. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Verse 28 and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. And then he says in verse 29, this is, this is something, for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. That's suffering like faith is a gift of God. That suffering's a gift from God. How, you know, how in the world can we think of it that way? Only by believing what God says. It doesn't feel good. <laughs> you can't go by feelings. Even chastisements, remember, he says no chastisement for the present is pleasant. Doesn't feel good. And somebody says, well, you know, uh, somebody says, oh, well, some of those martyrs, they went willingly and all that. Well, they probably did. I don't know. It, it, I know that that there is dying grace. I know it's by the grace and power of God. But that's what I'm saying is the only way we can really look at suffering this way is to believe God's word. We walk by faith, not by sight. And so that's what he's talking about. But now look at verse 17 again. He says that we may be also glorified together. In other words, this, this is... This should give us, looking to Christ and identifying with him, should give us assurance that we're going to be glorified. And look at verse 18, and it's an accounting. In other words, again, it's not feeling. It's not racking up our works. But it's an accounting that we make based upon God's testimony of Christ. And he says it this way in verse 18, for I reckon." It's an accounting that the sufferings of this present time, whatever we're going through, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. 
Now, there's no doubt here that what the apostle's talking about is final glory, in which there'll be no suffering. There'll be no sin. There'll be no sickness. There'll be no death. There'll be no sorrow. There'll be no more persecution. It will be the eternal bliss of eternity in glory with Christ. And that's described in 1 Corinthians 15. You can read the whole chapter. But that's what he's saying. It's an accounting that's supported by God's word, and it's based upon the merits of the obedience unto death of Christ. Christ died. He suffered, and he suffered unto death. He was buried, but he arose the third day. And he's the first fruits. In other words, you know, back in the uh, Old Testament, whenever the first fruits of the crop come in, if the first fruits were good, the whole crop was going to be good. And that's what Christ is. He's the first fruits. He's the guarantee that everyone who is sinner, it's all sinners saved by his grace, his true children who suffer for his sake, we will be glorified together. And that's our account based upon God's word which shows us the glory of Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. That's our accounting. And so whatever it is that we experience on this earth, whether we lay outside the gate with uh, poor as church mice and the dogs licking the sores on our, on our uh, body like Lazarus, or whether we're like Abraham and we've got plenty, got money in the bank and everything seemed to be going forward. What, whatever it is, it's not to be compared with the glory that's to follow. That's what we have to look forward to. We'll look at verse 18. Or verse, uh, uh, verse 19, rather. He says, for the earnest expectation of the creature or the creation waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Now, what Paul does here, he shows us that God has appointed a time when this fallen, sin-cursed world will be destroyed. It will be totally obliterated. And it's going to be replaced with a new heavens and a new earth. And that time will not come until the last one of God's children is brought into the kingdom by the Lord Jesus Christ sending the Spirit to bring them in. And then it says here, the manifestation of the sons of God. Now, as I said, that means to make known publicly. Now, we know here he's talking about final glory because uh, because listen when the holy spirit brings a sinner to believe in christ that's manifested to ourselves that's why we're given the the spirit witnesses with our spirit the spirit uh, uh, bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. in other words we have that assurance of of, of being his children and I know a lot of people, uh, I've heard preachers say, well, faith and assurance are two different things. I believe if you'll read the scriptures, you'll find that's not true. Now, somebody said, well, we have to fight and struggle with unbelief. We do. We do. But what is faith? It's believing God. Paul said it this way, I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. In other words, you say, well, you believe God. Well, you believe his word. You have the foundation of his word. You're looking to Christ for all of salvation, but you don't have assurance of salvation. Whenever, okay, if we ever have moments of doubt, times of doubt, what's the problem? I guarantee you what the problem is. Right there, that's exactly right. We're looking to ourselves. And that's not faith, is it? Faith is looking to Christ and him alone, pleading his righteousness alone. But when the Holy Spirit brings us in the new birth under the gospel, and brings us to, we're manifested to ourselves, and we're manifested to our brethren. Now, I'm not saying that, that we can't be fooled in some situations, but that's another message. But we're manifested to our brethren. I mean, I, I look at you, you folks here, and I see brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, 
if you really don't believe the gospel that I'm preaching, you can fool me, but you can't fool God. But I believe you do. And that's why we have fellowship together. The Bible tells us that if, if somebody comes in and doesn't bring this doctrine, don't have fellowship with them. I'm to reject them. I'm to be kind to them. I'm to tell them the truth. I'm to help them as a human being. But I cannot have religious fellowship with them if they don't believe this gospel. If they're ignorant of or not submitted to the righteousness of God. So we're manifested to ourselves. We're manifested to our brethren. But we're not manifest to the world. 1 John chapter 3. The world will not know us. You know... Somebody says, well, I want the world to know that I'm a Christian. Problem. The world doesn't even know what a Christian is. And the only way the world is going to call you a Christian is if you fit the pattern of what they think a Christian is, which is a lie. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not to be moral people and all of that, but morality doesn't make us Christians. We should be moral. That's not what makes us Christian. What separates us from the world? Our gospel separates us from our message, our doctrine. So when Paul says here that the earnest expectation of the creation waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God, it's obvious that he's talking about final glory because that's when Christ is coming to gather his church unto himself and it will be declared to the whole universe who his children are and who are not. The sheep will be separated from the goats at that time. You remember Matthew 25. But the whole world will know that all who believed in him, who, by God's grace, who were brought to faith in Christ, they're the children of God. And the world will admit at that time that they deserve nothing but condemnation and death. Every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now what Paul does here, he uses a, a literary device talking about the creation. Look at verse 20. He says, for the creation or the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. He gives the creation a human characteristic here to make a point. The creation was made, uh, was made subject to vanity. You know, when Adam fell, and this is really, somebody said this is a commentary on Genesis 3, 17 through 18. You remember that's when he pronounced, when God pronounced the curse upon Adam? You know, in Genesis 3, there after the fall, he, he pronounced three curses. The curse upon the serpent, which was the first uh, manifestation, the first public declaration of salvation by God's grace in Christ because the seed of woman who was going to bruise the serpent's head. So meaning that which Satan brought in, condemnation, would be remedied by the seed of woman, who is Christ. And then he pronounced the curse upon woman, and then he pronounced the curse upon man. And that curse, remember, he said the earth's going to bring forth thorns and all of that. What he's showing there is that when Adam fell and brought the, brought the human race into sin, and it, it affected the whole world. It affected this, this creation. Things changed. There began to be deterioration. There began to be uh, disasters. Uh, that's, that's when the animals started eating each other, that kind of thing, you know. And man could only earn his living by the sweat of his brow. His labor was not to be a pleasant labor after that. It's to be a grueling way of life. And instead of all the, the glorious things that grew in the garden before the fall, here comes up thorns and briars and thistles and all of that. So this, this creation, now, the creation was made originally by God to be good, and there is still some beauty retained in this creation. You can read Psalm 19, 1 through 6, the heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament of his handiwork. Uh, uh, you, people, you, you travel places to go and you see beauty. But it's all temporary, and it's all sin-cursed. 
And it's all headed for death. It's under the curse of sin and death. And it was made subject to vanity. In other words, vanity means worthlessness. And what I'm saying is this. Our hope and our salvation is not in this earth. You see? It comes from above. And that's why when people, as I say, reason from the ground up, they always go wrong. And I'll tell you what, I, I mean, I'll add this. this. This is what, you know, we, we need to be careful about this environmentalism. Now, I've always said we ought to be responsible and good stewards of the good things that God gave us. Uh, I don't want to drink dirty water, and I don't want to eat poisoned food. I don't want to breathe dirty air. And I think we ought to be responsible. But here's the point. This world's not our salvation, and we can't save this world. Environmentalists think we can save the world if we just do this. This world is headed for destruction. And I'll tell you this, man cannot destroy this world. Now, it's true that God may use man as an instrument in destruction. People talk about nuclear weapons and all. I don't know. I know this world's going to, you know, they talk about global warming. Well, read 2 Peter 3. The world's going to burn up with a fervent heat. That's global warming. <laughs> so it's going to be, but the prospect here, the, the, the whole creation was made subject by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Now, a lot of people have problems with this. Who is the him who hath subjected the same in hope? Some commentators say that's Satan. Some say it's Adam. You know who I think it is? I believe it's God. This was all God's plan and purpose, but here's why I really believe that he's talking about God. God's the one who subjected the same thing. He said he subjected the same thing in hope. And only God can do that. Adam didn't, listen, Satan didn't do what he did for the hope of mankind. Adam didn't do what he did in hope. But God does all he does for the good of his people. We're going to read about that later on. All things work together for good. That's our hope to them that love God who are the called according to his purpose. Only God can take something this tragic, the fall of man, the curse of the world, and make it a hope. But where is the hope? Not in man, not in the earth, in Christ. That's where the hope is. A new heavens and a new earth. Read about it in 2 Peter 3. I think I've got that uh, uh, listed here. But look at verse 21. He says, Because the creature or the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. There's the hope. Even this world is going to be made new. You know, they had the last, uh, this last week, they had tornadoes coming up through the Midwest. Boy, we've had our share of them. Yeah. Yeah, people killed. We're headed for the hope of a world where that won't happen again. We talk about how those are manifestations of the wrath of God. Whether the consequences of sin, where, where people go wrong is is whenever they judge people who are subject to those things to be worthy and they themselves aren't. Remember Christ dealt with that in Luke 13? He talked about those who were going to worship in Galilee and they were slaughtered by Pilate's Roman soldiers. And then he talked about a natural disaster, that tower that fell down. And he asked him, he said, do you suppose that they were greater sinners than anybody and they, they got that because they were greater sinners? Is that what you think? That's what man naturally thinks. You remember when, when the hurricane came through New Orleans? Well, oh, that sinful city. You know, they, you know, well, do you suppose that they deserved it? And we, and Albany didn't because we got a church on every daggone street corner? A false church? Huh? He said, except you likewise, or you, except you repent, you will likewise perish. If the tornado doesn't hit here, it's not because we earned it or deserved it. We're still sinful people. Our only hope is Christ and his blood and righteousness alone. So look at verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth. See, he's given the creation human characteristics here. 
It groans and travaileth in pain together unto now. How does it groan and travail? Well, you can look at natural disasters, kind of like creation groaning, earthquakes, wildfires, all of that. That's possible. But I'll tell you, you know, one of the greatest testimonies, I think, of the creation groaning, showing the testimony of God that our hope is not in this world, but in his grace and his power and his goodness in Christ, is the seasonal changes. Look up, and, and, and you don't have to turn there. I, we don't have time. I, I've got to quit. In Genesis 8, Ecclesiastes 3, and Psalm 74. What, what is the testimony of the seasons? You know, you've got spring, that's youth, and you, or, or, that's, that's birth, and uh, summer is light, youth, fall is getting older, and winter is death. And then it starts all over again. Like a tree drops its leaves, and then next year here comes more leaves, you know. That's that continual cycle. And what's God showing us? He's, he's showing us, look, we have a life to live. We have, we have a death to die. We have a judgment to face. We have an eternity to spend. And how are we going to look to those things? We look up. <laughs> how do we look up? I, you know, every time I look down my Bible, I'm actually looking up. Because <laughs> this is the word of God. <laughs> That's what I mean. The gospel. God said, I send my righteousness near, his near right. Christ came from above, sprung out of the earth, his humanity, and righteousness and peace kissed each other. And that's our hope. All right. <laughs>